Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is a weekly chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now I've drawn in the major support line here. It's right here around 1962, right where we are. We're still falling. You can see the MACD is still falling. And uh, how low will it go? That's the big question. So a lot of people ask, well, when is silver going to stop falling? I don't know. Remember, this is the price of paper silver, and I'm going to talk about that, of how they have the ability to do that. But I get a lot of uh, comments on the channel about, uh, you better get out now. Brother John F. is taking you for a ride and all this stuff. And a couple of points I wanted to make about that. First of all, as I pointed out in many interviews, etc., I have always liked to buy the semi numismatic coins. A lot of my semi numis are still worth 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars. I could sell them for that right now. I have no intention of selling them, but it makes it easy to hold on. It makes it easy to add more. The next point is that a lot of the people who say, a lot of the people who said, and were right, I'll give them credit when we were at 30. That we dropped down to 20 and that they'd buy uh, none of them seem to be changing their mind so my question to them is when is silver cheap enough to buy and of course I think that uh, their whole goal is to discourage people from stacking silver so of course no price is low enough it's always going to be a bear market we know that's not the case so you can see that we're hitting a support level in this uh, bear market clearly it is in the paper a bear market and uh, there's some things I want to talk about about that uh, the fundamentals but also the uh, size of the market and the futures and how that impacts it so I'm gonna go to the questions of the night first because they actually talk about a couple of the issues that I want to talk about that are related to that so let's go to those first and then we'll get into the main point of the update the first one is have you heard of Martin Armstrong and this is from Jenny Tolwartz hi longtime brother John F listener and investor in the PMs I've been reading Martin Armstrong's articles and blog for a year or so he used to be a contrarian big shot banker in the 80s, 90s, who was destroyed by the New York City banking cartel and imprisoned without charge for seven years. He's a cycles guy, totally against the bankster cartel. But although he thinks gold is a good hedge in the long term from 2015 to 2020, he predicted PMs would take a dive this year. He thinks we'll hit a new low next year too, then it will rise. He doesn't think we'll have hyperinflation, but stagflation where taxes will increase massively. He also predicts a big temporary rise in the dollar due to capital flows before PMs rise. To be honest, I'm confused by his analysis and PMs in general at the moment, but he seems to be onto something. Have you looked into his analysis? Yes, I've looked into his analysis. His analysis is based on the best that I can understand. Uh, it's called the confidence model. And I think that uh, the idea is that there are cycles in confidence. What I've found hard about his predictions to understand is that he sets dates for turns in the confidence model. And uh, I, I think those are kind of like Elliott Wave predictions. Not really sure how he derives those dates. I think that was part of the reason for his persecution. I don't have any doubt he was persecuted for uh, having very predictive models and not being willing to share them with the government. But uh, so it's a sentiment model. It's a cycle model. And the confusing thing that has always been the case for me with it is that I'm not sure which market he's talking about. He seems to jump from one market to another. So he picks a date where there's going to be a change in sentiment, but you don't really know what market that's going to affect. So he has a pretty good track record, but then again, sentiment changes and it could be in one market or it could be in another market. It seems clear right now. I don't know if he has a date. I think he had a June date recently 
for another turn in sentiment. Um, but then again, what are the odds of that just being true by random chance? We clearly seem to be having a sentiment change in the bond market where we're starting to see rates ratchet up tremendously. I think the 10-year note hit 2.6% today and uh, we had uh, Bernanke mumbling and fumbling about his new term tapering and of course on the weekend we had the BIS come out with a shocking admission that uh, QE doesn't really seem to work and we need to get away from that. So maybe we, we are having a major turn in sentiment in the bonds and that's uh, what his model predicts. Next question is from Demogirl06. Can you explain open interest? Hi, Brother John. I've been watching your videos and following the blog since May of 2011. Big thanks for your work, truly. From reading and listening to all the information, I've received an education in economics and finance that Econ 101 a few years ago never gave me. I have no background in finance. As time goes on, I read and have a better understanding of it all as one learns a language through exposure. After checking out Silver Doctor's Gold and Silver Commitment of Traders report, I must admit I still don't fully understand the concept of open interest. I googled it, but the definition was too vague. I know I could not explain to another person what it means or what influence it has. Would you mind dedicating a couple of minutes to explaining open interest as well as indications and impacts for those of us who, even after some time, only have a vague understanding at best? Cheers, Demo Girl. And we're going to talk about the futures market. So let's talk a little bit about open interest now. So open interest is a term that applies to the futures market. And uh, the way that it works is the futures markets are not like stock, the stock market or other markets where there are a number of shares that are for sale. So in the stock market, for example, you have an issue of stock. You have the float. You have a number of shares issued by a company, Apple, say. And there's this many millions of shares out there, and they're for sale. And if you buy those shares, then you're long the stock. If you want to short those shares, you have to borrow existing stock and then you sell it and you owe the stock. And then when you cover your short, you buy the stock back and then you pay it back to the person that you owed the stock to. So with the stock market, you're talking about an existing amount of shares that are out there that are either bought or sold or borrowed and sold, etc. In the futures market, it's different. The futures market is a contractual agreement between two parties for a future date. So for silver, for example, uh, one of the contracts would be next sep September. So let's say we had two parties that wanted to make a bet. It's essentially a bet on a future price. Who wanted to make a bet as to what the price of silver will be next September at uh, settlement date. So one party thinks that silver is going to go up between now and then, and another party thinks it's going to go down. Those parties agree, and one will buy a contract, and the contract is 5,000 ounces. They have to put up margin. Both sides have to put up margin. Now there's various uh, shades of gray, and we'll look at that when we look at uh, the margin requirements. Uh, you have speculators, you have hedgers, and that affects how much margin you have to put up. You have initial margin and maintenance margin, etc. But the basic concept is that you have one person on one side of the trade and another person on the other side of the trade. One is long 5,000 ounces of silver. One is short 5,000 ounces of silver. That is one contract. When those two parties agree to that transaction, that creates one unit of open interest. So if that initial party who wanted to bet on the price of silver in September decided that he wanted to make a huge bet, say 5,000 contract bet on the price of silver, then he would look for someone to take the other side of that. And uh, with both parties betting 5,000 contracts worth of bets, both directions, then you have 5,000 in open interest. Now, the way that open interest gets confusing is when open interest is rising and falling. 
and that's how a lot of the analysis is done about open interest so if you have people coming into a market and initiating new positions so if you have for example if you had a tremendous number of people interested in silver let's say there was some uh, publicity thing or some new breakthrough imagine if there was a new breakthrough that really the public got wind of and they wanted to invest in silver and they got into the futures market then you'd see the public piling in and going long all of these silver contracts that would mean that someone would take the other end and that would be an increase in open interest open interest would rise and uh, they would be initiating that position on the long side open interest can also rise if someone's initiating a position on the short side so for example in what I claim is manipulation the attack against silver from fifty dollars down you can have a rise in open interest caused by sellers being aggressive so you can have a lot of people initiating new contracts on the short side obviously someone has to take the other side and the long side and that increases the number of contracts in open interest the way that open interest decreases is existing contracts that are out there are liquidated are covered and then those go out of existence so it's somewhat similar to inflation and deflation in a fiat monetary system or a credit system you can have a tremendous credit wipeout and a whole lot of money just go out of existence because there's a huge sell-off and uh, that's the way it works so it's pretty complex to understand uh, there are a lot of formulas about open interest and whether it's rising or falling in a rising or falling market and uh, things that that mean but that's a little bit too complicated we're going to come back to open interest when we talk about trying to corner the silver market but let's take the next question here the retail price of a Kruger and this is from George Silver dear brother John F it's a long time since I asked a question so here goes gold dealers will make a profit over time whatever the price you often see this quoted but to me it doesn't seem logical maybe you can shed some light on the subject if it costs at the present time eleven hundred dollars to dig gold out of the ground and the paper price is a thousand dollars or less the mine and coin dealer would soon be out of business the above statement would only hold water if the price fluctuated above the real price of digging gold out of the ground farmers soon go out of business if they sell their produce for less than it costs to produce in Europe they're subsidized the point I'm trying to get at is if you know the break-even retail price of a Krugeran or a Silver Eagle for that matter then you know roughly when gold and silver will disappear from the retail market place Bernanke Draghi Comex the LBMA will not be able to disguise the fact no matter how hard they try so with your contacts brother John in the coin world what actually is the break-even retail price of one ounce of gold and one ounce of silver at what price is the retail coin dealer unable to replenish his stock well it's a little bit more complicated than that because silver and gold are not like a farmer who is producing a crop and the reason why is uh, a farmer will go out of business if they sell their produce for less than it costs to produce but that's the farmer is the only source of the produce uh, whereas with gold and silver these are not these are durable commodities they're actually money but they're durable that's one of the uh, characteristics of money that they possess and because of that they can be held and stored whereas the food cannot so in the case of the farmer he's the only one that supplies the food so obviously he can't sell at a lower price but when you're talking about a coin store uh, you can have a coin dealer actually having coins come in from people who already own them they don't necessarily have to come out of the ground they could be coming from existing stock you have your uh, we buy gold exchanges all over the place that are buying gold now that's not coming from mines that's coming from jewelry and in some cases a deflationary scenario where the prices are falling where economic times are hard can actually flush out more of that 
as people are trying to raise cash. So it's not a one-for-one -one sort of thing, but nevertheless, if the price is below the price it takes to get it out of the ground, you're going to see problems in the miners. Now, if you look at this chart here, this is a comparison of BVN, uh, PAAS, uh, CDE, SLW, that's uh, a, a Peruvian, I think, and then uh, Pan American Silver, uh, Coeur d'Alene Mines, and uh, Silver Wheaton. But you can see, even since January, a couple of these are down 50% or more. So the miners are in trouble. Jeff Nielsen has pointed this out. We're seeing layoffs at the mines. The miners are in trouble. And uh, that's because their costs are still rising or staying steady. But the price of the commodity that they're mining is falling. And it's putting on a tremendous squeeze. Now the other point that uh, is hinted at here is with the farmers you see in Europe, they're subsidized. Now, I think to a certain extent, probably the miners are subsidized. You have to remember that they're mining a lot of things, not just silver, not just gold, but the base metals as well. They also have boards that I have serious doubt about their integrity or their uh, loyalty to the stockholders. And there also is a lot of government interference. So it is quite possible that we could see a subsidized situation and that may, may be partly the explanation for what we're seeing. So let's get over to the main story of the night. Before we do that, I wanted to jump over and look at uh, Compare Silver Prices. And uh, I appreciate the shout out down here to uh, myself and Zero Hedge and TF Metals. Great site, uh, fantastic site. The thing I really like a lot is when you hover your mouse cursor above the coin you've got your price in dollars the left hand column that's going to be the red and you've got your premium on the uh, right hand column and uh, that's the blue and you can see how they track each other now if we go over to the junk it's kind of fascinating you can see they're both kind of rising and uh, they weren't doing that earlier they were actually diverging but you can see that on the Philharmonic. So uh, when we go to the premiums, you can see they're pretty steep. We've got 15% premium on junk silver. The lowest premium we can see here is all the way up at 5.68%, uh, and that's going to be for a 100-ounce bar. So even the 100 ounce bar at the best deal you can find has got nearly a 6% premium. So what does that say about prices? Well, it says that these prices haven't settled in yet. And uh, I don't know. If we go sideways here for a while, you might see those premiums come down a little bit. And you may see a tremendous buying price. So let's look over at this silver squeeze situation that I want to talk about. Now, if you remember in the 1970s, the Hunt brothers were accused of trying to corner the silver market and uh, they had accumulated a fairly large position beginning in the early 70s. If you remember, it was illegal for Americans to own gold, uh, so they figured that, well, uh, we can't protect ourselves from the coming inflation by buying gold, so we'll buy silver. So they started buying silver, and they initially started by accumulating physical, and uh, then they began to get caught up in uh, the futures market and uh, margin and borrowing and then they got some foreign backers they actually had a scheme they were going to run which was actually a pretty good idea where they were going to try to get some international trade going i think it was between the saudi uh, one of the one of the eastern powers maybe it was libya saudis and uh, the philippines or indonesia and get a three-way trade situation going of course the whole thing fell apart when the united states government basically changed the rules of the futures market but this is what I wanted to look at here is to show you today how ridiculously underpriced silver is 
by showing you how easy it would be to corner the silver market right now. That, of course, that's barring any type of changing of the rules. And as Jesse Livermore has said in the past, that uh, you have to expect the unexpected, and sometimes you have to expect the unexpectable. And, uh, and then there's downright cheating. And uh, there were many cases where the people who lost on their trades went running to the government squealing and uh, the government changed the rules so you have to be very careful uh, there were hints today at possibly John Corzine actually being gone after I have my doubts if that'll ever happen but it's very hard to trust the futures market to do what they say or to keep the rules fair but let's just assume that that's the case and let's look at these numbers to get an idea of how difficult it would be to corner the silver market right now so let's look at the margin requirements on silver now most of the margin requirements on the commodities that are traded run anywhere from five or ten percent you can see here that the margin on the initial margin on the 5,000 ounce silver contract is at 12,375. So we'll just call it a $20 price. And I uh, oh, sorry, that's 500. So 5,000 times that $20 is going to give you $100,000. So we're roughly at about uh, almost 12.5% of. Uh, the value of that entire contract to carry it. So let's look at the amount of money that it would take you to try to go for one year, one year's uh, supply of silver. So let's say that you decided that uh, you're a rich billionaire, someone like Carlos Slim or something like that, and you'd simply had it with the banksters. You'd had it with the silver manipulation. You had it with the Federal Reserve. And what you were going to do is to just put up enough money to take delivery of one year's worth of silver. And uh, the figure that I've given is uh, 750 million ounces. So let's take that 750 million ounces. That's the amount of silver that's mined in the entire world every year. Let's divide that by the 5,000 ounces that's in the contract. And that gives us 150,000 contracts. So 150,000 contracts is the amount of contracts it would take if one were to stand for delivery on all those contracts. It would take 150,000 of those contracts to take delivery of an entire year's worth of silver. So let's look at margin requirement and see how much money that would take. So we know that it's going to take about $12,375 per contract. So we'll multiply times $12,375. And the figure we get is $1.8 billion. So it would only take $1.8 billion deposited with the futures markets to buy silver uh, to control an entire year's worth of silver. Now, if one were going to take delivery, uh, one would have to put up about roughly eight times that amount. So ultimately, you'd have to put up $20 billion. Now, let's say you were willing to plunk down $10 billion. If you plunk down $10 billion and went long $10 billion on the futures market, you would be able to take control of more than five years worth of the world's silver supply. Now, you tell me, if there were a cartel of people or a group of people or even one very, very large investor who plunked down that $10 billion and was willing to come up with the rest and to stand for delivery for five years worth of silver, what would that do to the price of silver? So you can see by these figures here 
that uh, the silver market is a tiny, tiny market, and uh, the price of silver is completely determined on the paper markets. Uh, unfortunately, for the people who mine it and the people who coin it and the people who buy and sell it, uh, those prices are determinative, and therefore they are costing them a lot of money. But any person who was very serious about changing the situation uh, could take a little bit more than Ben Bernanke prints every single month and uh, they could corner five years worth of silver and uh, they could do far beyond anything the hunts ever imagined and they could drive the price of silver to the moon, destroy the shorts, probably even destroy the governments of the world and uh, it's very curious that you don't see any of them doing that and we'll talk to you next time.